Today, Rick and I are presenting a very special episode, and in just a second, I'm going to tell you why. But first, a little background. In our very first Mysteries of the Enduring Secret episode, Rick Russo and I featured the story of Michael Groves. Michael Groves was a captain in the United States 3rd Infantry, otherwise known as the Old Guard. He was assigned to command the Army Honor Guards at the White House, the Capitol, and at Arlington National Cemetery during the ceremonies that were part of the funeral of President John F. Kennedy himself in late November 1963, and he oversaw the Quezon Detachment during the funeral. Captain Groves' story was little known for some time, somehow escaping the attention of JFK researchers. But time, persistence, and a certain amount of serendipity would overcome the inertia of that story. It was like a dog lying on the rug, ready to awake or to be awakened. It was going to happen. The question was just how and when. Perhaps the story would have passed into obscurity, but a number of JFK researchers picked up on it. And here's a quote about it from the book, JFK, The Dead Witnesses, by Craig Roberts and John Armstrong. Captain Groves commanded the JFK Honor Guard for Kennedy's funeral, and he died under mysterious circumstances just seven days after the funeral. While eating dinner, he took a bite of food. He then paused briefly as a pained look came over his face, and he then passed out and he fell face down into his plate. He died instantly. On December 12th, his possessions and his mementos, which had been sent home to Birmingham, Michigan, were destroyed in a fire of mysterious origin. The honor guard, for some mysterious reason, had been practicing for a presidential funeral for three days before the assassination. Captain Groves was 27 years old at the time of his death. Cause of death? Unknown. Possibly poison. As you might expect, that kind of narrative inside of a JFK assassination research book leads to a great pause and great suspicion. Did Captain Groves, who was in control of the communications at the White House in the hours Right after the assassination, that day on November 22nd, did Captain Groves hear something, something suspicious about the president's death, or see something during the activities that were rapidly coming into play that night at Bethesda, something that would require him to be silenced forever? That leads, of course, to the story of Donald Reventish that surfaces after the fact. The story, which was an absolute oddity of an unidentified Army man leading a bunch of Navy men, Matt Bethesda, as they moved the president's casket into the morgue. For those of you who have listened to our Mysteries of the Enduring Secret episode on the two morgues, you know this story already. And the question, of course, was simple. Was that mystery Army man, Michael Groves, Seems like it might have been. And, of course, the very nature of what was happening at that moment, the use of a second morgue, possibly along with his knowledge of a larger goings-on that night, well, that has always been suspected as the impetus of foul play in his death. Tragically, this young man was known and liked by President Kennedy and his family. He spent time with John John and Caroline, and not surprisingly, his death brought sorrow to Jackie Kennedy as well. She actually penned a letter to Michael's widow, Mary Groves, expressing her sorrow after hearing of Michael's sudden passing, just days after JFK's funeral. All of this eventually led to the serendipitous story told on the very first YouTube episode of Mysteries of the Enduring Secret, told by David Blanco, who currently is a California resident. Some time ago, Mr. Blanco had lived next door to Michael Grove's parents in Michigan, and by chance, he would be invited over one day as one neighbor does to another and hear the story of their son, Michael Groves, and the story of his involvement in those moments related to the president's funeral. He would also hear that Michael died and he left a wife. 
in one young child, who was one more on the way at the time of his death. Michael's wife, Mary, was pregnant with their second child, Kim, who you'll hear from today. The story told to David Blanco by Michael's parents was so fantastic that he felt like there might be more. But those stories were with Mary now. And Mary eventually remarried, and the family connections were somewhat lost. You'll hear more of that today. But it launched David Blanco on a quest to find Mary and her family. And for a good part of his life, he's done just that. But his efforts were unsuccessful. And that was probably a good thing for Rick and I, as David agreed to tell his story to us in hopes that it would turn his cold lead into a new one, one that would be hot on the trail. David came on our show and did the very first interview of our new series, the very first Mysteries of the Enduring Secret episode. And what happened after that is exactly what we had hoped for. Folks watched the YouTube episode, and they reached out. Some of those folks posted on the YouTube site, and they had been tracking down Michael's family, and we're grateful for that. But what happened next turns out to be extraordinary. As we were contemplating what to do next, Michael's family found our episode on YouTube, and Dennis Vassar reached out directly to me. Eureka! (laughs) Well, Michael Grove's widow, Mary, is gone now, having passed away recently, as I said. But one of Mary's daughters, the unborn child that Mary was carrying at the time of JFK and Michael's passing, is coming forth to speak with us. Her name is Mrs. Kimberly Vassar, and it is her son, Mr. Dennis Vassar, who originally reached out to me. Both Kim and her son, Dennis, have agreed to allow us to interview them today. They're excited to be here with us. Even though the first-hand knowledge that Mary may have received back in 1963 directly from her husband, Michael Groves, Mm -hmm. even though that knowledge has now gone to the grave, the family storytelling of those events has been well-preserved with Mary's daughter and Mary's grandson. And that is what we're going to hear today as we give them the opportunity to tell that story in their own terms and set the record straight on those matters that may not be congruent with what is in the research community's current record. So let's see if they affirm the concerns that many have in the research community about this tragic story of yet another death in the aftermath of the JFK assassination. Was it a murder designed to cover up something essential to the cover-up itself? Or was it just another tragic death that happened during this passion play? Yes, folks, you just can't make this stuff up. So let's get right to it. Let's get to the interview of Kim and Dennis Vassar. All right, are you guys ready to go? Yeah, We're ready does, to go. Does Rick not have a picture? He doesn't. He's like, I call him like Bosley. He never, uh, <laughs> you know, remember that? Uh, Charlie's yeah, Angels, you're laughing. Hello, you Angels. Yeah. <laughs> Dennis, it's Rick. Uh, I'm curious, how did you happen to find uh, the uh, podcast that we did? My mom, about your- my mom actually did. So um, she found it probably last Sunday, I believe. Um, she does... Uh, she Googles about, you know, Mike every now and again just to see what's out there. Um, if there's any people that are, you know, doing, you know, articles about it or any new pictures or what have you. And she stumbled across it. And um, she actually told my wife about it when they were driving down to Green Bay. And um, then my wife told me about it. And I was like, well, you know, let me look at it. And, you know, um, I watched the full episode um, that night and, um, um, I, you know, watch it. I reported back to my mom and, um, she said, well, you know, I kind of just did it independently reaching out to Jeff and, um, sent him an email, um, and said, you know, this is who we are. Um, 
this is what we're all about. We'd love to chat if you want. And um, here we are. All right. Well, we're here today on this Saturday morning with Mrs. Kim Vassar and her son, Dennis Vassar. And we're going to hear the real story of Michael Groves. And also here with us today is my colleague and co-host on the show, Rick Russo. So welcome, Dennis. Welcome, Kim. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having us. So we're going to let you just take it away and tell the story. Um, I'm Kim, and uh, my mother was pregnant with me when my father passed away on December 3rd, um, 1963. Um, the story goes that he fell into his food and, and died. Um, the story that she told me was that he came home from work. It was a normal um, early evening. My sister was there. Um, she was three and my mother was cooking. They were in the kitchen and she had her back toward him and said that she said that she heard him um, sort of sigh and um, and then he fell on the floor and she picked my sister up and sent her next door to get the neighbors and Interestingly, um, I talked to my sister about this the other day, and my mother was um, strangely unemotional about the story that she told us. Um, she and my father were very much in love. I'm sure, I don't know if she just compartmentalized it and, um, and took the emotion out of it just to keep going. She was only 25. And, um, and now a widow with two little baby girls. And so um, it was just strangely unemotional. And that's the same story that you talked about in your previous podcast that everybody else um, sort of regurgitated. The same, you know, that he, that he was at home and he had a heart attack. And, um, and that's the only story that I ever heard. Um, with the advent of the internet, um, every once in a while I would look around and, you know, you look up people you know and, and I would type his name in and um, some things would come up and, and things that I had never considered. Um, some people were saying that he had been poisoned perhaps and um, I had never heard that. So I waited a couple, a couple of years because that's, you know, disconcerting. And, um, and I went to my mother and I said, I said, do you think that Mike was um, poisoned? And he said, and she, she said, no, um, that he didn't seem like someone who had been poisoned. And I said, well, what does somebody seem like who's been poisoned? And she never answered me. Mm. Mm. And so I don't know if she wondered also, it's, um, it's not as if um, she had ever been told to be quiet about something because it's like she had been paid off or something. We didn't have a lot of money or, you know, um, I'm sure she, she had some survivor's benefits and stuff, but she was a working single mom in the 60s. Uh, was, there, uh, was there ever an autopsy report that was furnished yes. to the family? Yes, and um, I know this to be true because um, my mother's brother, um, Ted um, Miller, was a pathologist, and he requested a copy of the report. And um, the way he described it to our family, my um, my grandpa, my mother's father was also a doctor, and um, the way that. Um, they described it to my mother was if you had um, put dropped a toothpick into a working mechanism and it messed it up somehow, but you couldn't point it out. I think to me as a as a nurse that suggests some kind of um, arrhythmia that he was trying to explain um, cardiac, and um, and that makes that made sense to all of us. I think it's super interesting that my grandfather, my mother's father, who was a doctor, we spent lots of time with them. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. Louis. 
um, after um, after my dad died, and um, well, we were close to them our whole lives, and they never mentioned Mike. Nobody. We just hmm. didn't talk about it. And, 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 uh, and was it just because it was? I mean, obviously, it was a tragic event for your family. Uh, but was it also a function of the fact that it was, it happened in such a high profile, perhaps controversial, uh, moment I, I in history? Just, um, no, I think it was, I think we just, we just didn't talk about those kinds of things. Hmm. And my, my mother was, um, a very fifties housewife. Um, and when she was married to Mike and, um, um, and she would never, I know this to be true. She would never have asked him about his work and he would never have told her anything about his work. And, um, hang on, I have some notes. Um, she said that he was quote, just gone after the assassination, he came home, got some uniforms and left and she didn't see him for several days. That's interesting. So, uh, so obviously there was uh, probably as one might expect sensitive things that were going on at the white house or in the role that he played that at times required more discretion. And uh, she probably got used to that, right. As a, as the wife of somebody who has such a high profile position inside the white house. Correct. And, and she would have been very respectful of that. The, the real question or a basic question about the fact that uh, uh, there's some time discrepancies. Uh, obviously, December 3rd is the official date associated with your uh, with his death. And uh, and, you know, there is some controversy that perhaps it was much closer to the date of the uh, of JFK's funeral afterward. Can you comment on that? Um, I can tell you um, without a shadow of a doubt that it was December 3rd was the day that he died. And the reason that I know that was 25 plus years later, um, um, the man that she married and had two other children with, he had a near fatal accident on the same day on December 3rd. And she told me after that, that she remembered standing in the driveway thinking, what the hell is with December 3rd? And um, here she was about to lose her second husband on the same day. So there's no wow. question that it was December 3rd. Wow. Wow. That's, that's an incredible story actually as a, as a method of validation for the, for the date. And, uh, yeah, so I, I'm certain. There's, um, we have a book here that was presented by um, the Honor Guard, and there's a letter that gave me pause um, from some army guy, um, where they, of third battalion. where they, uh, third commanding battalion. officer of the third battalion, and he um, wrote a letter and said that they had gone and paid respects to Mike in a small ceremony. And it was dated coincidentally, December 3rd. And I thought, well, how could that be? But then I looked at the date of the letter and it's 1964. So it was a year later. I got it. It was actually on the anniversary okay. of his passing. Yes. Yes. Got it. Mm. Wow. Well, that makes sense. Tell us a little bit about what happened afterward, because obviously there was a move involved and uh, your mother moved back to Michigan pretty quickly. Is that not correct? Very quickly. My grandparents were on scene as fast as you could get um, to uh, Fort Myer in 1963. And they swooped um, her and my sister up and we all went um, back to Ann Arbor. She lived with um, my grandparents um, well, we lived with my grandparents for about a year after I was born. And um, then she rented an apartment on Wilton Street in Ann Arbor. And we lived there for about a year. And then she bought a house in Ann Arbor um, um, on Saunders Crescent. And that's where we lived until 1973 when she married my adopted father. You know, there there is some suspicion that... Uh, perhaps documents or papers or other relevant evidence 
may have been transported uh, as part of the move and then suspiciously lost in a fire. Uh, that's obviously part of the lore that's out there. Uh, is, is there any truth to that? Can you shed light on what happened in those uh, ensuing weeks as, as she returned to Michigan? Um, actually, the fire was in Cleveland at Mark's oh. or at Mike's home, um, parents' home in Cleveland. And, um, and it was a significant fire, but there it wasn't any, like she would have been the, the recipient of any documents. And then there was no fire in Ann Arbor. Okay. Um, that's, that's probably my, uh, was, my air. Um, that's my air was, then. <clears throat> but, but I think that the question on all of that, of course, is was there, uh, anything that she might've had in her possession mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, might've been, uh, something that lent itself to understanding what really went on that night uh that you know might have been part of a cover-up or or uh, might have lent itself to understanding exactly what went on at bethesda or uh perhaps something he might have heard uh, in the course of those uh, five or six hours in the afternoon when he was at the white house uh uh, at, right after the assassination, so on and so forth. Anything like that that uh, you can shed light on? That certainly is part of what the lore is that sits out there in the in the literature. I don't know where any documents would have been. Um, I know in our house, um, when it was just the three of us, um, there was a trunk in a closet in the basement that contained some um, uniforms and um, some other um, photographs and th things like that. Um, but, um, but I never was aware of any specific secret documents or anything like that. Um, like we had, like we had this, this album that was presented to her or sent to her or something. And, um, and it has um, photographs of his funeral and, um, and things like that. But um, that trunk was, um, we moved to Florida in when I was five or six and we lived there for a year. And somehow in that move, that trunk was lost. Hmm. So I don't know whatever happened to it. So, uh, you know, so many uh, also questions perhaps surrounding, uh, you know, just the, uh, uh, the relationship that he had with, you know, with JFK as well. I, I know that uh, JFK uh, uh, knew of Michael and that they were, uh, you know, they were uh, friends, so to speak. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure there was a, a great opportunity for, for Michael to look up to a guy like that. It's amazing to have, to be 27 years old and have some sort of uh, exposure to one of the greatest presidents, you know, ever to uh, inhabit that office. And uh, mm -hmm. sounds like there was a little time even spent with John, John and Carolyn and, and others. Mm -hmm. Can you shed a little bit about what, um, what that was like? They had, had, of course, their professional relationship, but then they had what my mother described as an acquaintance type relationship. Um, um, my father um, did spend time, like downtime with him, but it was still professional time. So they didn't go out and have drinks or, you know, those kinds of things. They weren't like friends. Sure, like sure. Well, and, he was the president. Um, he probably didn't do that with a um, lot of people, period. <laughs> the only thing that we really, huh? Oh, I was saying he was the president, so he probably didn't do that with many people, period. Right. But you know, just <laughs> to get any sort of personal exposure to a president is a pretty, is a pretty amazing thing. Right. The only thing that we have um, from the Kennedys uh, is from Jacqueline Kennedy, um, um, a short note from her um, uh, expressing condolences um, to my mother, I think from one young widow with small children to another, you know, and that, that's, then that's, that's beautiful. I'd love to, if you uh, have an interest in doing so, I mean, if you 
if you would shoot us a picture or something of that, we sure. would certainly sure. put it up on the on the video along with so people can see it a little bit uh, more uh, mm -hmm. more conspicuously. And then this, one, this one is also from her, and this is a note um, in February 1964 um, congratulating her on the birth of me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and, that's wonderful. Um, and acknowledging that the circumstances are not necessarily happy, but yeah. but it's nice. So we'll send you photographs of those. Yeah, that would be that would and be wonderful. I have, never had them, I have never had the signatures authenticated if they were done by machine or um, or her hand, um, but they look they look pretty real to me. That's got to be something very special that you you know maintain in your possession. That's really a beautiful thing yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you uh, personally after? you know, hearing it all over the years, have any question in your own mind that there was any sort of, you know, foul play associated with Michael's death? What What is your personal opinion on all of that? Um, I don't know if me and my, me and my mom have discussed this a couple of times. Um, you know, we both have our own reason to have pause, right? <laughs> Um, you know, a 27 year old man who has just gone through, you know, um, screenings and testings and things to that effect to go to Vietnam. Um, he's not supposed to die there. You know, medically speaking, there's very, very, very few things that can, you know, kill a man of, um, of, of his, of his caliber and his physical capacity. He's in the best, he's in the prime of his life. And, um, you know, that gives me reason to believe that there was something done or something, you know, some foul play. But, um, you know, it, there's so, like you said, everybody who was there, everybody who was involved in this, if it were to be foul play is dead. And they more than likely, if there was foul play, took that with the grave, took that to the grave with them. So, um, um, I actually had a, um, a heart condition and um, I ended up having open heart surgery. I had atrial, atrial septal defect. Oh, wow. And yeah. um, so after I came out of surgery um, at UCSD in San Diego, California, me and my mom had a conversation. It was like, well, you know, what if, you know, what if this slipped through the cracks? Genetically, I right. I had made it through MEPS. I had made it through screenings, okay. boot camp. I was asymptomatic as an 18 year old kid, 19 year old kid. Um, I played four sports in high school. I never had any hindrance on my ability physically, even with, you know, an enlarged left side of my heart. So um, it, it, it gives you a second to think like, well, maybe there wasn't foul play. Maybe he had the same thing that I had because mine went undetected for, you know, 18, 19 years until they did an advance, like, you know, um, a, a further delve into it and did a, you know, a modern echocardiogram and all this stuff, but I had no murmur. I had no, I had none of that. So um, one of the things that makes me believe that um, it's possible that he died naturally is that the, what the doctor said to me, and I remember this vividly because it's not something that a 19 year old kid will forget. If we didn't catch this, you'd be lucky to see 25. Well, so, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty that strong makes me uh, think that, you know, if, if he did have the same thing that I had, maybe he just made it a couple years past what he was supposed to. And eventually time caught up because time always wins. So. But on the other side, because I'm a nurse, I, um, my sister and I, we came from a medical family. I told you my grandpa was a doctor. My uncle was a doctor. My cousins are doctors. Um, I, if there was something wrong with his heart, I think they would have been really paranoid about us. And there was never any, any of that. And, um, and it wasn't quietly explored. It wasn't, um, um, so when Denny was diagnosed after boot camp, it was a huge surprise. Um, um, the kind of heart failure that if it had gone on, um, you're symptomatic first. You know, you're not, 
it's not a sudden death. It's a symptomatic failure of the heart. So I'm, I'm just not sure. And I don't know, I don't know anything about this Reventish story. Um, I don't know where he was after the assassination and those, uh, all my mother said was he was gone. And, um, and he was, he was gone until after the funeral, I think, um, barely saw him. And, um, and then, um, you know, very little discussion, just back to normal standard operating procedure. So, um, so I don't know. I, I, I wonder, um, but I don't think we'll ever know unless, um, unless we exhumed him. And I don't know if they did toxicology. The other thing about his autopsy was um, everything was on paper then and they sent it to, um, because it was old news, you know, he was out of the military. They didn't need to keep his records. Allegedly, they sent it to a warehouse, a holding place somewhere in the Midwest that burned. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know. So everything's on fire. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was excited when you said that the number one, a formal autopsy actually was done on your father. Mm -hmm. And number two, mm -hmm. an autopsy report was created. Uh, mm -hmm. But if I'm understanding correctly from what you just said, the family doesn't have a copy of that report now. I, um, my uncle Ted died, um, probably seven or eight years ago. I never saw that report. So I wouldn't think that that would have been something that he would have kept. Um, he had five kids, so I'd have to ask each one of them individually if there were any papers, but I would doubt that. I would doubt that. Well, <clears throat> the question, the two questions that come to mind for me, uh, is number one, uh, what was the date of the actual autopsy that was performed on your father? Because the very next day, within 12 hours uh, of, of your father's passing, uh, which is December 4th, you have a representative from Pennsylvania, James Fulton, that's going on, uh, you know, on the floor of the House of Representatives to talk about the unfortunate passing of your father. A and he's stating that you know, he died under stress from a heart attack. Well, how would this how would this representative Fulton know that it was actually a heart attack that was the cause of your father's death if they hadn't performed the autopsy yet? So that was one question that I had. But the other thing that struck me is that uh, if if in fact the, the autopsy report states definitively that your father did in fact have a heart condition, which I guess was unknown to everyone at that time. He was only, what, 28 years old. Um, and, and it stated that he did die of, uh, of some kind of heart condition. Why, after the fact, for years later, were your grandparents, Michael's parents and Michael's sister, so adamant about the fact that they felt he died suspiciously and not of a heart attack at all? I never heard Don and Gladys say that. Um, I knew that they carried their grief um, very close to the surface for the rest of their lives. Um, we were um, not as close to them as grandparents as we were to my mother's parents, um, but that was mostly by um, location. Um, we did spend lots of time with them. Um, during holidays and birthdays and things like that, because they lived in Birmingham and we lived in Ann Arbor. It's not very far. I, um, I never heard them say anything that they thought something had been done to Mike. Um, but like I said, we did not discuss, we didn't talk about it very much. And um, my grandparents um, coped um, the best they could but I know that they were probably very annoying to some people who were involved and maybe um, to the point where they were asked to not um, call anymore. And um, 
could you could you elaborate on that just a bit? I know you're being it sounds like you're being careful and I don't want you to reveal anything you feel uncomfortable with. But who, who in fact, were they talking to, do you think? Um, I know my my mother said um, that Mimi um, was Gladys would call the command um, frequently late at night, um, um, not having all of her faculties. And um, and I know that that happened regularly. My mother said um, that she didn't that Gladys did not cope well, and um, um, and that was that's one thing that I really remember. Um, well, I can I can relate. I, I will just say this, Kim. I can relate to. Uh, I don't how remember. D- Don was um, was not. I didn't have much of a relationship with. No, uh, I, 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 I was going to say I can relate to the idea that, you know, obviously uh, I've lost a child myself. So I understand that the, I, I think a little bit about the grief of losing a, a child. And, you know, you can understand how they may have wanted to, uh, you know, continue to yeah. inquire. I mean, you're yeah. always curious, right? Like what what exactly you know, what could have been done, what what was done, so on and so forth. So I do think. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's one of the tragic aspects of a story like this, for sure. And, right. Um, and my mother also um, lost a child, and um, she said afterwards um, that she wished that she had been nicer to Mimi about her grief, because yeah. I think my mother thought it was embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. To totally understand. Uh, Let's pivot. But you if have you don't- to understand that my grandma, me, me and Don were obsessed with Kennedy's assassination and my dad. Yeah, we didn't say anything. I think that was just a, yeah. Uh, I So the, the uh, obsession part, uh, so, it, you know, that would seem like that would naturally lead, you know, with uh, their son having been involved in the funeral and then the sort of the unusual circumstances under which he passed to, to wonder. I, I can't he imagine did. that they didn't. It's no exaggeration that they had probably 20 paintings or photographs or collages from other people, um, tons of artwork work in their home um, about um, Kennedy portraits, books, um, all kinds of knickknacks, and it was like walking into a museum a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I can, can understand that, and perhaps uh, heard many stories, uh, you know, from from Michael directly about uh, things maybe he experienced in the White House. You never know exactly what may have uh, transpired there, too. You know, it's a he was obviously like all of us, you know, a highly admired man, and particularly uh, after the assassination uh, there's a little there's a martyr element of it all as as well too um can i uh oh go ahead one other thing i wanted to tell you was um my aunt darby um she died when she was 37 um um and she had metastatic breast cancer um she had one son named daryl michael and he was about six years younger than me and um, and he died also. Uh, um, he died of pneumonia. He was never really well. I don't know. He's kind of. He was born with a. Oh, he was born with a with a. He was premature. He weighed about a pound when he was born, and he had what was called tetralogy of Fallot, which is um, which is um, a combination of heart defects. Mm-hmm. And. Um, and so he, um, anyway, he died. But his dad, his dad's name is Ray Kissinger. And Ray Kissinger is 87 years old. And who knows what Darby told him. So he might he might be willing to talk to you. But um, I haven't <laughs> talked to him in years. Well, that's helpful. I, I, I uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll follow up on that. And uh, I will say this, my, I lost my father at 96. He passed at 96. And and I was lucky enough to have a father who still had all of his marbles. He was, uh, he had, he had, he had a uh, recall better than anyone I ever knew, even at that age. So, 
pretty amazing, right? You never know. Yep. You never know. So you never know. Well, I pre we appreciate that because that's really part of what's uh, come about in uh, this series. What we had hoped to achieve in this series, which is to uh, get out there, be on the World Wide Web of, uh, in some form or fashion, and let uh, and have people uh, uh, hopefully find find it just like you did. I mean, you're a, a perfect right. example of what we were hoping to have happen and uh, tell the story and straighten out uh, anything in the story that uh, might have become, uh, you know, inappropriately articulated over the years for, for lack of clear firsthand knowledge. So, uh, Rick, um, you know, do you want to, Rick, do you want to talk about the Reventish story at all? It sounds, Kim, it sounds like, you know, something about it, but maybe not much. Would you like, I, Rick? She probably learned it from your podcast. I'm okay. sure. Got but. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. That's yeah. The, first I'd, the first I'd ever heard that. And, um, and like I said, my mother didn't know where he was. And, um, well, so it, it does. It does point to the idea that he was right there, right at Bethesda, potentially. Well, one question I have for Dennis, and I'm sure Kim can can add something to this as Maybe. well. It, it, you know, speaking of the internet, it's the fact that you know your father was not some ordinary army captain. He was captain of the White House Honor Guard. Not only did he have tremendous responsibilities that weekend, with the funeral procession and everything else. But but um, what's interesting is if you Google your father's name, there's only one photograph, which looks like a high school graduation photograph. Uh, it is. Uh, it is. <laughs> that, that, that appears nothing pertaining to his um, time as a as a captain of the honor guard. Um, you know, uh, and, and Dennis, you know, you're probably much better at this than I would ever be. Uh, as far as the, um, navigating uh, the website at the JFK Library. But I tried mm -hmm. to go on there, and I typed in Captain Michael D. Groves. Nothing comes up under his yeah. name whatsoever, which I thought was kind of, you know, strange considering the importance of his job during the Kennedy um, administration, number one, you know. And number two, I figured, well, you know, and I thought, well, you know what? I'm probably doing this all wrong because I have no idea how to work these whole websites from mu museums and everything else. But I said, you know what? Let me try something just for fun. I typed in one of the names of the other members of the honor guard. And they pop right up. So one of the mm -hmm. things that I think that man that we interviewed on the, in the previous podcast episode, David Blanco, uh, found interesting is the fact that you can't really find much information at all uh, about your father and and you know we're not saying that that's necessarily su suspicious but at the same time you know why isn't there more out there about him do you have any idea uh about any of this um obviously you know um there's there's a couple possibilities and i like to see it from both sides before i formulate an opinion so both extremes of the situation it very well could be um just to you know protect his name just because you know the last thing that they might want to do is um you know tarnish someone's name or you know something like that or expose something from the family that might be private they want they may have wanted to keep it private or somewhere down the line you know um Mike's parents might have been like, hey, you know, we would not like our son to be included in this just for privacy purposes. Um, no, they but, would never have said that. But exactly. So you know, it could have been that. It probably wasn't. Um, but the lack of reporting on him on the JFK, uh, um, um, like, history website or whatever it is, um, is very concerning just because of his high profile within the administration being captain of the honor guard um, in the white house, being at that high position and not having information about him is it's kind of like, well, like, you know, one of those there, like, why wouldn't they have it on there? But why could, could you... was he... I know that he was captain of the honor guard and he was hand selected by Kennedy. Yeah. 
Well, you know, that, that that's why, you know, Dennis, I don't know if you're better at these things than I am, but perhaps you can go on, online to the JFK library and see if you can have a better, um, you know, do do better at, at getting some more information to see if there's anything at the library uh, uh, about your grandfather, because, uh, you know, it just doesn't make any sense, as Kim said, why he wouldn't be mentioned, even in the smallest context of, you know, a photograph that shows him leading the funeral procession or, you know, a few other things pertaining to his job as captain of the uh, White House Honor Guard. Uh, it makes yeah. no sense, you know, if, it, you know, if in fact that's the case that they've eliminated all that information. If they haven't, then it would be interesting to see what the JFK library really does have uh, about Captain Groves. Uh, but I wasn't able to do it. In fact, in order to even put in a request, to yeah. the JFK and library about something like this. You have to first send them something, you know, with a specific document number or something that you're searching for, you know, so they don't make yeah. it easy. Yeah. I, w one thing I want to point out, though, and, and Rick and I uh, emphasize this on the work that we do. We don't want to speculate on, you know, yeah. the, sometimes just the absence of something is the absence of something. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, but it's odd in this circumstance that someone of high, such high profile in the overall uh, sort of story, the after story, uh, who played a prominent part and died in such an odd way is uh, not depicted in greater level of detail. It's just it's just an anomaly. And uh, when you add it up with all the other anomalies about this story, it it's what it's the kind of things that particularly people who have a wonder about if there was more uh, contemplate. So it's nice to be able to uh, nail some of these things, just like we're nailing down the fact that uh, he died on December 3rd. There was a lot of suspicion around the idea that he died just a few days after the funeral and that there was a very hurried process mm -hmm. to, you know, to bury him and, and to, uh, uh, sort of close the chapter. And the fa that fact is just untrue uh, based on what you have stated. So the more that we can take these one by one and simply eliminate them, if they are in fact untrue, then the, the more the story comes into focus about what it truly is, if in fact mm -hmm. it is just that. But uh, you're right. I don't think anyone's ever going to know exactly, uh, uh, but you never know. Uh, someone may be watching this right now. We've, we, we've, uh, some things we have not revealed on, on, uh, air yet is, uh, we've had many people come forth and say things about certain things that, uh, uh, really give more insight into, um, what's there. And, and there is sometimes a reluctance to say anything publicly about still, even to this day, 60 years later. One question that I had was um, he he was he was a captain, and there were majors and generals and people above him um, that commanded him. And why would he um, I don't know why would why would he why would they not know not have known or Oh, we got hung up again. Oh, you're back. What? Why would he have not known uh, what exactly? What are you? Uh, what? Just let me follow so your the, question a little bit. The senior officers at Fort Myer who were above my dad. Like my dad was like an. He was a captain. It wasn't. It wasn't like he was a four-star general. Um, um, he was a captain, and I know that he had a really important job and was hand selected and all that but he had bosses and so why weren't why were they why were they possibly I mean, if not a as uh, and if if well i think we can only speculate on that but i i mean i would just yeah, say that i true. think the farther the farther up you are in any hierarchy uh mm -hmm. you know probably uh the perhaps the less concern they might have been about uh, those folks 
staying in line and saying something if there was something to be quiet about. There's a lot to lose, I suspect, uh, especially if you had a large pension, you were a large, uh, you know, you were you were close to retirement or, or any of those kind of things. And that's honestly, it's just totally total speculation. But there have been instances in the discussions where people mention those kind of things. And so there are they're just practical considerations and in, in that. And uh, and maybe the reality was if you were I don't think and, and Rick actually has great insight into this because he's one of the few people left on the face of the planet that actually interviewed the, uh, the hand, many of those people who were there that night at Bethesda. And, uh, you know, they were sworn, they had, they all had secrecy agreements. They were all required to, you know, to, to, and be sworn to And I suspect so was, you know, your father and, uh, uh, you know, so I, I don't think any of them probably said much of anything, but they, there's a human aspect to this and I'm sure they all sat around and, and, uh, if there was something, they made assessments on who might say something and who might not and, uh, mm -hmm. or what they saw and how, how critical what they saw or heard was, if there was someone who, uh, uh, heard something that was critical to maintaining a, uh, a secrecy of these events. And um, again, all speculation on my part, but uh, you know, and, and, and quite frankly, it might've only taken somebody uh, saying that they might say something or say, or, or have, or say something to someone and have it come back to a senior officer. There's all sorts of scenarios one could, uh, fabricate, you know, hypothetically in this case, and, uh, we're not going to go there, but you know, you always wonder what actually, uh, occurs, uh, if in fact something nefarious was to have happened. Yeah. Well, the, 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 uh, sense I get from Kim is that, uh, uh, her father never shared anything with, uh, her mother as far as anything that he was involved with uh, in, in any capacity. Is that pretty much true? I uh, believe that to be true. So if your father, in fact, under orders from his superior, let's say General Wheel, who was head of the uh, Metropolitan uh, District of uh, Washington, uh, and he was assigned to be at Bethesda late, that afternoon into early evening to receive the body of the president of the United States, unbeknownst to everybody else who thought it was, you know, being driven from Andrews Air Force Base in a gray ambulance in, in, a, in another casket, uh, then that's something that he obviously never discussed with your mother, because I'm sure that's important enough that your mother might have shared that with you over the years, correct? Right. I think she, um, I think she told us everything she knew and, um, and then, and then she just didn't talk about it. Yeah. I mean, that's a really a highly sensitive aspect of the entire, uh, cover up per se, if it, if, if it occurred and even if it occurred for national security purposes at the time, uh, the idea that there might have been, uh, I don't know if you've listened to one of our other episodes, but uh, Rick does a very uh, thorough job. And there's quite a bit of evidence indicating that there were two morgue locations that night at Bethesda. And there was the receipt uh, in, at two different locations at, at, at slightly different times of different caskets. And, uh, you know, some of it m may have been uh, quite straightforward as part of a security measure. But uh, there are other factors that indicate that perhaps not. And so anyone involved in that process would have been privy to some highly, highly sensitive information. And uh, when you combine the fact that your father was uh, right smack dab in the middle of a tremendous nexus of communication that occurred in a very critical period, hours just after the president's assassination, all the communications that came in to the White House that he may or may not have had an opportunity to hear or hear about. Uh, he was in a pretty sensitive uh, circumstance, but regardless of whether 
anything ever came of it. So if you look at the, you know, the, 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 um, over the surrounding facts that, um, that uh, make up that day for your father, it's, there's quite a bit there to, uh, to, um, you know, to wonder about in terms of uh, how all that might have impacted something if something did occur. Um, we're just gonna we're gonna switch over to my phone here just because the Wi-Fi is not great. Just for ease of listening and hearing everybody. Sure, sure. I have something I want to say. Okay, cool. Just one second. Um, can I talk? Or are we off? No, I'm not off. Hold on. Is I, we can still hear you. You're 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 on. Okay. Right now. So yeah. so a couple of years ago, I thought it would be nice for Denny to have Mike's medals, and so there's a there's a I googled it. There's a a place online where you you can get um, records and and medals and stuff, and and they'll send them to you. And I thought, well, that would be nice. So I sent um I sent the the request. And forgot about it. And then two years later, I remembered and I um, I called and I left a voicemail and I said, you know, this is my request number. This is what I want. And um, a couple of weeks later, an envelope came in the mail and I can't put my hands on it today, but it was just Mike's service record. Um, when he came in, when he died, where he was stationed his height, weight, just very basic information and nothing else. Oh, oh, oh wow. Sadly. And, and so I was, I was really disappointed because I wanted Denny to have the medals and, um, and I don't, don't know, I don't know why they won't give them to us. So yeah, that's, getting, that's another, that's another, that's another, uh, you know, data point, just like what Rick was pointing out. Why, why the dearth, of a uh, response from the government regarding if someone who obviously was really uh, prominent in their, in their own history. Right. The military. We have, we have some certificates. This was part of the, the Groves museum um, <laughs> in Birmingham. Um, but this, we have this. So we know that there's a army commendation medal. This is signed by Cyrus Vance, by the way. Oh, that's wow. Amazing, that's amazing. <laughs> Was he head of the art? Was he uh, head of the Department of the Army at the time? What was? Do they have his title there? Secretary of the Army. Secretary then, of the Army. Yeah. Um, so there's so there's two of them. Um, commendation medals. So there are at least two medals that he had, and I just think it's kind of curious now that at first I just thought they were, you know, just being lazy about it, but now I wonder. So uh, Kim, Kim, do you have any photographs at all? of your father during the time he was serving as captain of the honor guard? Oh my gosh, yes. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and a gazillion funeral. Um, I know Mr. Blanco said that he had a big um, uh, funeral that was like presidential and down Pennsylvania Avenue. And I know exactly where he got that information and it is incorrect. Um, there's a, um, a photo stream on Flickr that um, that shows part of my father's funeral, and then the, it skips to um, Kennedy's funeral because my dad is in some of those pictures. And so they've um, intermixed. They've intermixed some of the Kennedy funerals, and and someone thinks that that's part of your father's. I get it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's well, great. That's great that you uh, that you, that see. That's another data point that uh, uh, all goes into the lore that has come to be this story. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have a question about that because uh, have you heard the name James Felder, Sergeant James yes. Felder? Yes. Okay. Well, in speaking, he was very close with your father. Mm -hmm. In fact, in, uh, coincidentally, a, after the funeral on the 25th of November, the president's funeral, Felder was already slated to be t uh, take a leave. Uh, vacation or whatever, but then because of the assassination, he stayed on, was part of the uh, honor guard that handled the casket that whole weekend, so forth and so on. And then he left to go on leave. And when he came back, that's when your 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 mother 
called him up and, and informed him about your father's death and had asked him if he would be one of the pallbearers for your father's funeral. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and in fact, Felder wrote a book where he has a number of photographs of your father's funeral procession and so forth and so on. But, but it does seem that your father was given pretty much the exact same funeral as Kennedy was given, other than the, the horse blackjack w was not used. Uh, but other than that, a lot of the same, you know, caisson and everything else was used with your father's funeral and Felder participated in that. Are you saying that that's not quite true? Um, I'm saying that he, they did not go down Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, the service was at, um, the Fort Myer Chapel that is right next to the gate at Fort Myer to Arlington Cemetery. And um, and then he, there was a riderless horse at the, pull, with the case on. Yeah, I can show that as well. We have a whole, a whole photo album of the funeral. So it was a big deal, but it was, it was limited to um, the Fort Myer um, uh, campus by the gate and then to um, um, Arlington National Cemetery. But there was a band and there was, you know, it was a big deal, but it was not, nobody marched down Pennsylvania Avenue. One other thing that was that was mentioned, and I and perhaps you can clear this up as well, Kim, is, is that y your father was actually buried at Arlington in close proximity to the president. Do you I know anything always, about that? I had always heard that, and I was very disappointed when I went to visit that it's not really very close. Okay. One more thing, Jeff, that we've cleared up today, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, this has been absolutely spectacular. I'm so uh, gratified that uh, Dennis uh, uh, and, and Kim, uh, that both of you would want to come on and spend time with us. I think you've done a great service to your father's and grandfather's memory. And, uh, you know, this is part, this is a really important part of American history. And we're trying to uh, not only tell the story, but tell it accurately. And this is helpful for that. And um, we really appreciate that. Is there anything that you would uh like to end with uh, and and say to anyone listening to this today uh, uh, be, uh, that you haven't already said to the audience? I can't think of anything. I just, I'm going to look more closely at the things that we do have. Um, you know, when you lug them around for um, 50 or 60 years. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, and we'd love if you, if there are any of those pictures uh, of your father and your grandfather that you would like to uh, uh, provide to us. Uh, and if you can do that timely, if you'd like to do that, um, I'll certainly uh, put them in the. Uh... Get rid of it. <laughs> okay. Well, sure. I mean, love to have them as part, you know, we're, we're here long enough that it would be nice to have them as a, uh, what I normally do is because Rick's uh, mug is not on this uh uh, on the zoom, you can't see him. I usually put them right up over there in the corner on the, uh, on the gallery where his, his picture would normally show. And, uh, so we have lots of, you know, we have lots of time to show many of those pictures. So this uh, Dennis. One is one of my favorites. And this is my father, um, um, guarding Kennedy's, um, casket in the rotunda. And this picture was used um, in Life magazine. Hmm. And, um, and I used to have a copy of it, but I can't find it. And um, anyway, I've always liked this photo. And, and it just shows, I mean, he was a dedicated, dedicated soldier. And he, he loved his country and he loved what he was doing. And I think if he had survived, he would have really done great things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I... De De Dennis. Uh, or Kim, uh, is it possible that you can uh, contact or reach out to the JFK Library, number one, to see if they even acknowledge, uh, you know, your father in any capacity, number one. But number two, more importantly, if there's some documents or information at the library that would give us an idea exactly what your father's 
uh, responsibilities uh, were that entire weekend, uh, starting with the 22nd, uh, and, and to see whether there's actually any any paperwork on that. Well, maybe um, just a FOIA request would um, would do all of that, and they. Yeah, the the library is actually, I think, a nonprofit uh, organization. I, I'm not sure you even need to do a FOIA. I think you might even just uh, write a letter indicating okay. who you are. You're obviously pretty significant to their to your father's story, and and perhaps they would uh, accommodate you in in doing that. Okay. Yeah. Well, Rick, uh, anything else from your end that we would uh, want to ask today? No, I think we cleared cleared up a lot of uh, misconceptions about Captain Groves' story. There's still so many questions I think are unanswered, uh, and we may never have an answer as far as his, what he was involved in uh, on on the actual day of the 22nd. Um, you know, but a, a, as Kim mentioned, you know, Donald Rebentish, uh, when I interviewed him in 96, 97, uh, he was adamant that not only was he taking orders from a young army captain in a naval setting on that day, but that he was told a week later by his superiors that the man that they were dealing and taking orders from that day had, had died. And that bothered a lot of those men that were under his command for that one afternoon at, at Bethesda. Uh, so, uh, there's a lot more st to the story than than we we know right now, and maybe someday we'll have more answers. But still, something that has to be certainly looked at for sure. Mm. Um, Mr. Blanc did say one thing about my uh, my grandpa Don, and um, he was an engineer at Ford in the heavy truck division, and there was some question as to whether he was. Um, um, like not really an employee there or um, like he could do what he pleased. And yeah, I think he, I think he implied, I, I don't want to put words in, uh, in his and, mouth, but I think he implied that. Yeah. I think he implied that perhaps uh, somehow he was uh, being compensated to be right. quiet. And that, yeah. that was really the implication of that comment. I think. I, um, he was a Ford employee. He was a Ford guy, um, like a million other Ford guys in Birmingham. And um, and my, I asked my sister about those crazy cars that they said he drove. And I don't remember those, but my sister does, and she's older than me. So um, um, the pimp mobiles, so yeah, true. right, then, right. <laughs> once my mother remarried, she remarried a guy who was really conservative and um, who drove Lincolns. And so they had lots to talk about all the time. And interestingly, Don's last car was a carbon copy of my dad's, of my adopted dad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, That's Kim, a great story. Kim, did you, Kim, did you ever have the opportunity to, to meet uh, your father's sister? Oh yeah. Darby, um, Darby actually, when I was seven, when we moved six or seven, we moved back to Ann Arbor um, from Florida. And she actually lived with us when her son, Daryl, was a baby. And um, and I think it was because we were close proximity to a children's hospital and he needed um, close cardiac follow up after he because he had a big surgery when he was a little bitty over it. And um, um, but yeah, her her name was Elizabeth Darby. Groves and she married uh, Ray Kissinger when Daryl was about five, I think, and um, um, and they divorced, but it was um, it was platonic, you know, it was amicable, and um, yeah, I don't now, know. What, now what Darby had very, according to David Blanco, that was on that last podcast that we did. Uh, when he met your, you, you know, uh, your father's sister, Darby, she had very strong feelings about uh, your father's death as well. And uh, I, I assume she never discussed that directly with you. No. Well, uh, th this, uh, this certainly has been uh, in incredibly interesting to 
speak to the both of you. Dennis, I'm so glad that you uh, took the original initiative and and reached out. And uh, Kim, it, it's been lovely to hear your story directly. And uh, we're, we're uh, you know, we're excited to be able to publish the follow-up of this. Um, hope you stay in touch. And I hope, uh, you know, if you find out things that you think are important that might be uh, relevant to the rest of the story, please, you know, don't hesitate. And, um, you know, we're, we, you know, we're same, same, same here. You seem like lovely people. And we're really glad that you were wanting to share your story. And we want to be able to tell your family history. It is something you should be incredibly proud of, you know, your father, did something absolutely spectacularly amazing that not very many people in the course of uh, their life get a, you know, would have a chance like that to do and to represent their country in the way that he did. So we're, we're, we're proud to be able to bring the story onto the JFK, the enduring secret. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure mm-hmm. speaking with you and, um, and Rick, it's been awesome talking to you guys. Um, and like, you know, I sent that email last, what was it, Saturday or something like that. And you were within an hour and a half, you emailed me back, like, call me, call me. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, we're, goes life, both. You, know, um, you know, it's it's awesome. I love my family. I love where I come from. I love my heritage. I'm very proud of who I come from, where I come from, my whole family history on my dad's side, my mom's side. Um, it's just awesome that, you know, people care about my family and want to listen to my family talk about my family so <laughs> it's just it's just awesome and it makes us you know have a, a, a greater sense of pride in and of ourselves so it's just awesome and wonderful listening to what you guys have to say about it and what my mom has to say about it and even though we talk amongst ourselves every now and again about it it's fun to talk to somebody else you know <laughs> sure yeah well, absolutely dennis i can also tell you from the uh from the men that served with your f- uh, grandfather, like Sergeant James Felder, and even Bobby Lee Hayden and, and others, they all tremendously admired him and mm-hmm. and and considered him a very good friend and, and couldn't say enough great things about him, uh, the time they spent together with the Honor Guard and Fort Meyer and all of that. So you have a lot to be proud of. I think I appreciate it. He was actually, you know, I my my dad was um, in the Coast Guard and my his father was in the Army. And um, obviously, you know, my grandfather on my mom's side was in the Army. So um, all of that together inspired me to join the military as well after some roundabout ways of getting in. But you know, I, I tried to get him to join the Honor Guard and he wouldn't do it. I'm not tall enough. You have to be six <laughs> foot. Uh. <laughs> Well, that's a good that's a good that's kind of a good segue right uh you know uh well wonderful well thank you so much for being on today i hope you enjoy the rest of your day i, I uh will we'll hope to hear from you soon and uh stay in touch please always you have two more friends in the community i'll email you pictures and all the stuff i'll scan them and send them and all we've got all we've got everything okay that'll be wonderful we'll incorporate those into the into the into the uh into this episode for sure thank hey, you again hey kim. hey kim and if you can find that autopsy report that would be great <laughs> i'm gonna mess with my cousins because that's that's the only way i think we could ever know anything about it it's very important yep i know okay All right. thank you so much. thank you again you have a good day see you bye-bye, bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Mysteries of the Enduring Secret. And please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, JFK, The Enduring Secret. And remember, you can find our award-winning podcast, JFK, The Enduring Secret, on all of the popular podcast outlets. Please don't leave just yet. So little was known about Michael Gross that we made a decision to do a small photo memorial of him and I hope you'll enjoy the next few minutes as you watch these stirring photos of his life and his service to the country.